Welcome everyone. I'm going to give it just a few seconds for everyone to join this today's session and then we'll start. Wait just another five to ten seconds. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the director of the Humanities Forum. Welcome this week to this special two-week series devoted to the late Representative John Lewis. This week, we have the privilege of hosting uh, one of our own here at PC. And next week, I hope you'll be here to join us as we host Andrew Aiden and Nate Powell, who worked with John Lewis on their Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel, March. A couple things about the format today. This is a Zoom webinar, which is a little different from a normal Zoom session that you all might be used to. We will be recording today and the recording will be posted to our website within a few days, no later than early next week. And we are including some discussants today, some student uh, contr contributors to the session today. And so our question uh, period is a little different, and I'll let Dr. Breen talk about that um, in a moment. It's now my pleasure to introduce our host for this afternoon's session. Dr. Patrick Breen is Associate Professor of History here at Providence College, a scholar of American history. His concentrations include African American history, the American South, and slavery. His book, The Land Shall Be Deluged in Blood, A New History of the Nat Turner Revolt, was published in 2015 by Oxford University Press. I'm also pleased to say that Dr. Breen has been an important inspiration for the work of the Humanities Forum since its founding five years ago. He is a great friend, one of the most thoughtful academics I know, and a crucial part of our common intellectual life here at Providence College. It's an honor and a pleasure to have him present today for the Forum on March and the legacy of John Lewis. Dr. Breen. Thank you, Raymond, for that great introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's really a special, special moment. Uh, before I begin, let me just say thank you for coming to this. Uh, obviously, it looks like we're in for another week of being under um, I isolation and restricted and not in class and doing Zoom. So um, I really, as, as, as a teacher, as a neighbor, um, I know this isn't easy. It isn't easy on our, our, ourselves, our families. Uh, we really appreciate what you guys are doing in for us. If you need to check in with someone, do. Uh, this is a really hard time. Uh, and reach out to people, talk to people, because it, it is isolating being isolated. Um, I also want to. Um, thank especially uh, Jade Roman and Katie Burdick who are joining us today. Um, today we are going to have, we're going to try to have a somewhat interactive um, talk on the life of, um, of John Lewis and um, they kindly, uh, kindly volunteered to step up and try to be the audience in the participation. Um, I do want you guys who are out there to feel free to do questions today. I'm not, I'm not really the person that's going to be answering the questions. I'm going to give an outline of John Lewis's life and sort of use uh, March, the book that um, we're going to be talking about next week um, as a way of getting to it. But, um, but I do want you guys to send questions that I can ask uh, Andrew Aiden. Um, who was a former staffer with John Lewis and Nate Powell, the illustrator who drew the graphic novel, uh, graphic novel, graphic autobiography. So um, feel free to ask questions to us, um, but also this entire week, if you think about anything, if you go read some more on John Lewis, feel free to come up with questions because we want to be able to ask these people who knew John Lewis um, about uh, the man and his legacy. All right, um, so my goals for today are a couple. I really don't assume that you guys know who John Lewis is. I know some of you do, and that's great, um, but 
I just want to introduce this icon of the civil rights movement to you. I also want to introduce you to the book that we're going to be discussing next week. And I'll be presenting a PowerPoint, um, hopefully, that is going to have their um, is is going to have uh, panels from the uh, from the graphic autobiography that you can look at. And one of the things I want you know I want you to pay attention, sort of see how do they. Um, situate John Lewis? How do they portray his life in a graphic autobiography? It's a, it's a genre that most of us don't teach very often. Uh, occasionally we do. Mouse gets taught in Western Civ some, but by and large, um, graphic novels, graphic autobiographies are not um, the, the ways uh, academic historians work, although I think there's more interest in the field in it than there was 10 or 15 years ago. But I want you to think about it. You know, what's good about this? What's bad about this? What questions do I have about this? Um, so pay attention to the slides. Look at it. See if you like it. See if you don't like it. It's a, it's a, it's 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 an interesting way to think about how we portray history. Um, the other thing I want to do is I want to think about uh, John Lewis's legacy. And to start on that, I want to start with a clip. And now I'm going to have to do some Zoom sharing. So hopefully this will work. I want to start with a clip from John Lewis's funeral. John Lewis died on uh, July 17th, uh, 2020. We came up with the idea for this program after he died, um, after COVID came in and wiped out our on-campus programming for the fall. We said, you know what? Let's, let's do this. It seems appropriate in the era of Black Lives Matter and all the issues that we're facing and looking at to go look at this lion of the civil rights movement and his legacy. Uh, July 30th, uh, 2020, uh, the funeral, the, they had the funeral of uh, John Lewis and Barack Obama spoke at it. Um, um, so let me see if I can share screen. Um, and I'm looking for Safari. That's probably it. No, that's it. Uh, I don't want to share desktop. I don't want to. Am I, are you guys seeing, seeing the picture of Barack Obama? Okay, I'm gonna hit play and uh, let me know if the volume's okay. Jade and Katie, I can see you. We see the Zoom screen, however, we do not see a picture of Barack Obama. The life of John Lewis was in so many ways exceptional. It vindicated the faith in our founding, redeemed that faith. That most American of ideas, the idea that any of us, ordinary people without rank or wealth or title or fame can somehow point out the imperfections of this nation and come together and challenge the status quo and decide that it is in our power to remake this country that we love until it more closely aligns with our highest ideals. What a radical idea. What a revolutionary notion. This idea that any of us ordinary people, a young kid from Troy, can stand up to the powers and principalities and say, no, this isn't right, this isn't true, this isn't just. We can do better. On the battlefield of justice, Americans like John, and Americans like Reverend Lowry and C.T. Vivian, two other patriots that we lost this year,
by John Lewis. He, as much as anyone in our history, brought this country a little bit closer to our highest ideals. And someday when we do finish that long journey towards freedom, when we do form a more perfect union, whether it's years from now or decades, or even if it takes another two centuries, John Lewis will be a founding father of that fuller, fairer, better America. John Lewis will be a founding father. What does that mean? What does that mean? I wanna, I wanna um, get to that. Now, let me see, is this being shared now? Jade and Katie, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the, um, this is something that we've discussed here at Providence College, most notably in January 25th, 2019, when Nicole Hannah-Jones came to give a talk on a project she was working on, which she would eventually publish in, 2009, in August of 2019 as the uh, 1619 Project um, in the New York Times. She ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for uh, commentary for this project. And in this project, she asked in those terms, how should we think of our founding fathers? Should, who should we think of as the founding fathers of this nation? And she asked that Black Americans, this, as much as those men cast in alabaster in the nation's capital, are this nation's true founding fathers. Here we are. Who are the founding fathers of America? And what does it mean? What does it mean? And, and I'm going to ask, because I can't ask everyone who's here, I'm going to just ask Jade and Katie if they can tell me, what would it mean if, John Lew if we started thinking of John Lewis as a founding father to you? I can speak. So I think the idea of people like John Lewis and other civil rights activists being a founding father attests to um, civil rights activists actually living up to those American ideals. Oftentimes when we think about freedom and justice and we think about our roots as a nation, it's kind of contradictory in reality and in history. So when you think about Black Americans that actually fought for equity, for justice, for equality, for fellow Americans, I think that attests more to actually being essentially American. Katie, do you have anything to add? Um, Jade, that was said so beautifully. I think most people think that the Founding Fathers are in a specific time period back in the 1700s. Um, and I think that by adding John Lewis and other Black Americans, it kind of extends that America is still being founded. It doesn't just happen when the Constitution is written, when we declare our independence from Britain. It's an ongoing process that many people have contributed to, not just a set of white men um, that wrote up a document. All right, well, so this is one thing I want to, and those are great. I mean, thank you so much. This is why I asked Katie and Jay to join us because they're so awesome. But um, this is one thing I want you to think about as you look at this, at the story of this man, the story of this man told in a graphic novel. What does it mean if he's, if he's gonna be a founding father? What does it mean for us? What does it mean for our society if we are gonna change how we think of the founding fathers and it's not just gonna be Thomas Jefferson and George Washington? but it's going to include John Lewis. And I think there's an ambiguity too in, Hannah, uh, in Nicole Hannah-Jones's question and that, that Barack Obama picks up on, which is, are we thinking of him as an addition to the Founding Fathers? Or are we thinking of John Lewis and people who are these great freedom fighters as replacing the Founding Fathers? And I think that there's an ambiguity there and I think you wanna think about that because I think it's a fair question. Are we replacing George Washington and Abraham Lincoln with these people or are we adding them to the Pantheon? And it's something to think about and it also is gonna influence how we think about the Founding Fathers going forward. So thank you both for those um, 
insights. All right. So there's, uh, there's Nicole Hannon Jones at PC just over a year ago talking about her great thing. Okay. I am technologically savvy. I'm not going to talk about two things today. I'm not going to talk about John Lewis. I mean, I'm not going to talk about a lot, but I'm not going to talk about John Lewis's legacy as a congressman. And he served as a congressman for decades from Georgia. And we're not going to do that. We're just going to talk about his legacy as a civil rights icon. And we're not going to talk about him as an icon. Here he is. This is, this is John Lewis walking on, the, on your right with uh, Bill Clinton in a Selma march. Here he is um, hand in hand with Barack Obama on the left. It's something that he's going to do. He's gonna, he lived so long. He was the last surviving uh, person who spoke at the March for Washington. Um, in 1963. He's this guy who lived forever. Uh, well, he didn't. He only lived 80 years. But so many of these uh, great leaders, including Martin Luther King, uh, died young. Malcolm X died young. And so we don't have them with us. But he, John Lewis stayed with us. And, and he, was, he was someone who was part of our lives uh, for so long. And so then he became a person who was sort of the conscience of of the Congress, they, uh, they called them. And, uh, you know, someone who was, everyone understood, you know, when, when Bill Clinton and Barack Obama are holding his hands, it's probably Bill Clinton and Barack Obama who are really sort of flattered by this. It's sort of, you know, he really is a living icon. And, and uh, I'm not gonna talk about that part of his career either. I'm just gonna talk about his youth thinking about him as the founding father. Okay, what's his origins? He's born in Alabama. His father is a farmer in Pike County, Alabama, which is about um, 50 miles outside of Montgomery, Alabama, south. Um, on the farm they were at, uh, they grew 110 acres of cotton, corn, peanuts. And this is how Lewis, Aiden, and Powell uh, portray that farm he grew up on. His father bought the farm for $300 back in 1940. And so one of the things we often think of is about the poverty of the South and the South, and blacks in the South are poor. But that doesn't mean that some weren't more independent. And John's, uh, John Lewis's family was more independent in that they did own their own land, even if it was a relatively not a incredibly rich family. It was certainly a family that was able to provide for itself and was not in any sort of um, ongoing debt. Um, the key to his youth, at least as he tells the story, and I want you guys to think of this, you know, when, when we talk about our, our founding fathers, they have the stories. Like, uh, Katie, what's the story of George Washington's youth that we all know? Uh, the cherry tree. <laughs> Absolutely. We got to have those stories. And John Lewis has been developing one of these stories too. His story goes back to his religiosity. When he was a young man, he was very religious and he lived on a farm and his job was taking care of the chickens. Jade's already skeptical. Like, really? Okay. Well, he did. And I got to somehow get on to this. And so there he is on the farm reading his Bible and really being struck by it. What did he do? Well, he preached to my chickens just about every night. And there he is reading the Beatitudes to his chickens. Okay. This is an interesting, this is, this is different. But this humanizes him in, in the way the cherry tree humanizes George Washington, I think. Okay. And so here he is. He's looking for the chickens to say amen. They never say amen. He thinks that they're getting it, but they're not there yet. Okay. And so then he's preaching and he gets to the righteousness. And I was the preacher and theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, I think you can see what's coming, can't you? Can't you? The problem of preaching to farm animals is Sunday dinner. There he is. So this is the story. He's very, so how does, how do they get to his religiosity, which is really central to understanding his youth and his involvement in the civil rights movement. They have this story about how serious he was, how he, how he, you know, and here it is. He sat there and his congregation is served to him on Sunday night. Yeekers. Um, but there you go. Okay. So He's religious. Um, 
Of course, he's not just religious, he's religious growing up in the South in the segregated era. And though he was surrounded by loving parents and a great family, their love could not protect me from the unholy oppression waiting just outside his family circle. Unchecked, unrestrained violence and government sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles. There aren't Skittles, are there? It can't be right, but anyway, going to get some candy or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare. He's growing up in a segregated world. He might be in a better situation than many because his family owns their own land and he's got the security of religion, but that's not a lot of security in a world of Jim Crow racism. Now, of course, there's gonna be the moment where we're gonna see a growing activism. And what is that moment? The moment is the one that no one can, occur, uh, can ignore. It's the moment in American history that really galvanized the African-American community. And you know, if we're gonna say the civil rights movements in some way that, that the heroic age of it starts with Rosa Parks, we have to remember Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat just months after uh, Emmett Till's death. He was in Alabama. Emmett Till was from Chicago, came down to visit his family in Mississippi. The story is, and it varies, he whistled at a young white woman who was uh, attending the store as he left to show, to show off to his cousins and his friends. Um, they, um, that was, he went home, didn't think anything of it. Actually, it happened on a Wednesday, on Saturday. Uh, the man's, uh, the woman's husband and another man came and grabbed um, Emmett Till from his bed and beat him up, uh, whipped him, tried to make him apologize for what he did, said that he never apologized. He got so frustrated, they decided to kill him. They wrapped his body uh, around a, um, uh, around its a tire there. I, th I think it's um, actually a uh, ginning fan. Um, and threw him into a river. His body was found a couple days later, decomposing. And the picture showed up in, 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 in the black newspapers when uh, Mame Till, Emmett Till's mom, had an open casket funeral. Well, this galvanized uh, the black community really across the United States. But imagine being John Lewis. Emmett Till was 14, John Lewis was 15. Now what happened? Well, the men who did it were tried. Mose Wright, his grandfather, came up and said, "These are the guys who grabbed him out of the bed, out of their bed," and they were uh, they were tried, which was actually you know, a level of justice, sort of more than many people expected. But they were tried before a jury of twelve whites who were not going to convict um, two white men who said that they were. Um, putting an African-American in his place. And after a very short time, they came back and were found not guilty. Uh, the two men then sold their story to Look Magazine, in which of course they admitted that they did in fact kill Emmett Till, but there was nothing that could be done at that point. The case had already been tried. And here are African-Americans looking and saying, 14 year old boys are killed for no reason and there's nothing we can do. And the killers admit it, and there's nothing we can do. John Lewis um, writes later, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Richard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could easily have been me. And I think that this is something that John Lewis certainly in the last year of his life was, was thinking seriously about, thinking about the way the civil rights movement was spurred by some really horrific killings and, the, and, and seeing strong parallels to the world we live in today where Black Lives Matter is energized and re-energized every time that there's a new, um, a new killing um, of a black person for, for no reason or, you know, 
it's it was he sees he sees he sees strong parallels and something I want you to think about. All right, so he's become galvanized and act, become activist, and and so he goes up. Now he goes to American Be uh, Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. Um, his mom had been working in a Baptist house and found out that you could go to college uh, and pay for it on a work study program. So he's like, that's the college for me. And he goes up and he goes up and he's taking classes that are probably not that dissimilar from what you guys take when you take your Western Civ classes. Um, and he's interested in it. But, you know, when he thinks about religion and philosophy, the parts of religion and philosophy that were most interesting was the so social gospel. He's thinking about how we have to make our world better. Um, here I was reading about justice when there are brave people out in the world trying to make it happen. And so he wanted to do that. Now, the way he decided to do it originally is to go to, um, is to apply to Troy University in Alabama. Uh, Troy University was an all white university and he's gonna be the man who desegregates it. He's gonna be that, the, the front edge of the desegregation movement in America. He actually gets to meet Martin Luther King at this point because Martin Luther King wants to meet the kid who wants to desegregate an Alabama state school. Um, they meet, this is gonna become a long life connection, John Lewis, he is a disciple of Martin Luther King. Uh, Martin Luther King and James Lawson are the two most important influences in his life. And when other people are gonna move away from Martin Luther King's vision, especially it's nonviolence and it's Christian idea of the beloved community, John Lewis is not. John Lewis is gonna remain wed to these ideas through the civil rights movement and, and beyond. Anyway, he applies to, uh, he doesn't, it, it, Martin Luther King and, and the leadership of the Alabama Civil Rights Movement say, we will help you sue Alabama, but the one condition to sue Alabama we need is your parents have to agree. John Lewis went home to his parents the next day, told them what it said, and the parents said, we are not agreeing to sue the state of Alabama. So, John Lewis went back to Nashville, which turns out to be one of the most important things that happened in John Lewis's life. I mean, he would have clearly been an important figure in the civil rights movement if he had integrated Troy State and been part of an uh, important lawsuit. But the most important thing that he did uh, was going to Nashville, where his, he got involved in what became the most active and vibrant part of the student movement in the 60s in Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee was a, a growing group of activists were meeting around a guy named James Lawson, Jim Lawson, who was a divinity student at Vanderbilt, uh, at least until Vanderbilt kicked him out, uh, much to Vanderbilt's embarrassment today. And Jim Lawson was preaching, we need to have uh, nonviolence. We need to be uh, civilly disobedient. We need to be in a, in a pacifistic way. We've got to stand up for our rights. He's going, to, uh, he's going to galvanize the young people of Nashville and many of the leaders of the civil rights movement, uh, Diane Nash in this slide here, uh, John Lewis, Marion Barry, um, a ton of people, uh, James Bevel, um, Bernard Lafayette, a lot of the people that if you get into the civil rights movement are really prominent figures in the civil rights movement are gonna come out of the Nashville movement. All right, so in Nashville, they're meeting every day, trying to figure out what we're going to do next. This is 1959. What are we going to do? We got to do nonviolence. And um, they're meeting in January, trying to figure out what they're going to do. And they're thinking, we're going to host a sit-in, which is interesting because the same, at the same time, completely independent in Greensboro, North Carolina, four students at North Carolina, uh, 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 North Carolina a and decided that they too were gonna host a, um, they were gonna have a sit-in. And so February 1st, 1960 in Greensboro, North Carolina, the um, four students sit in and decide to, they're not gonna get served because it's a segregated counter, um, but they don't leave. They just sit there and no one knows what to do actually. The early sit-ins aren't met by violence. It's only later when the 
the segregationists find out what's going on, that they do uh, attack the, the people who are sitting in. Uh, interesting thing, and I want to point this out to you just for the people who are going to be here next week. Um, what we see here, both on the left and on the right, is the importance of a comic book. Uh, there's a comic book uh, that is produced called the Montgomery, Martin Luther King and Montgomery, the Montgomery story. And it's, about, it's made by uh, the uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, also known as Four. And it's basically trying to celebrate Martin Luther King as like a Gandhi figure. Now, this is 1956, 1957. This is really early. But the idea is they're trying to get to young people. Okay? And so here they are. And uh, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the young, one of the freshmen who sit in at the, uh, and, uh, North Carolina, at, in the Greensboro Counter had been reading a comic book. I think that's important to the people who made March. They're thinking, hey, you remember the analogy, you, just like Floyd is, you know, Till and Floyd are like, that comic book that inspired them was the Montgomery story. The comic book that might inspire you is March. Okay, so what happens? Um, well, I, I, I put this picture up because this is famous picture. These are the four guys sitting in in Greensboro, North Carolina. Classic picture, you might see it in a civ class, you might see it in a history class, an African-American studies class, iconographic portrait. And again, here's one of those moments where we can sort of compare how the uh, artist sort of decides to draw it and sort of what's different and what's the same. Okay. Well, what happens with this? The sit-ins in Nashville are incredibly successful. They sit in, they get themselves arrested. Um, they're, and the idea is they're just going to keep getting arrested. They're okay with getting arrested, which is weird. It's sort of hard because uh, most African Americans a generation older really tried not to get arrested because jail was a very bad place to be in, to be if you were in, find yourself if you're an African American. Um, it's in the South, that's not where you wanted to be. But these guys weren't afraid to go to the jail. They weren't afraid to fill the jails. And, you know, here we have John Lewis reflecting on the first time he gets arrested uh, as part of the uh, uh, as part of the Nashville sit-ins in February of uh, 1961. Of course he sees this as the first of many and I think that this is one of the things you want to think about too. If every founding father has their sort of origin stories that humanizes them like the chickens, how do they relate to power? Founding fathers tend to be powerful people and John Lewis is going to be a powerful person. But he sees himself as someone who's supposed to get arrested, and he's proud of his arrest. What is that saying to you? I don't know. All right. The national movement is successful. The sit-in movements are incredibly successful. And this is going to lead to um, John, Lewis, uh, John Lewis and the Nashville group emerging as um, as important figures in the civil rights movement. And so now I wanna take you through three more parts of the civil rights movement. We've done, we've talked about the sit-ins and John Lewis is clearly a prominent figure in the sit-in movement in Nashville. And then we're gonna talk about the Freedom Rides, okay? John Lewis is gonna be a, another, he's gonna be the person who's both prominent in the uh, sit-ins and in the Freedom Rides. Core is going to decide in 1961 that the laws that said, the interstate commerce laws that said segregation was illegal should be real. And so what they wanted to do was take a bus or two buses from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, where they were going to show, uh, they were going to have an integrated, integrated bus, whites and blacks together, and the, and the whites would go to the black sitting rooms and the bathrooms and the blacks would go to the white wa washrooms and they would desegregate the South. They just wanted to show that it could happen. And so CORE calls for volunteers and John Lewis immediately signs up. He says, this is exactly what I'm signing up for. This is what I want to be a part of. Well, He's, a, he's one of the ones who's chosen. And so May of 1961, they meet up in DC and they start their um, tour. They immediately go down to Fredericksburg and Richmond and run into no problems at all. 
Um, in fact, it's sort of weird that whites go to the black bathrooms and blacks go to the white bathrooms and nothing happens. When they get to South Carolina, however, the story changes. And um, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, they're going to get attacked. And uh, they're beaten up by ruffians who know they're coming. Um, John Lewis is injured in these attacks. And uh, the night he ends up at a junior college, spending the night in a dorm, he receives a telegram from a Quaker organization that has, wants to interview him for a fellowship to go study nonviolence and pacifism in India for uh, two years. John Lewis, John Lewis is your age, right? I mean, he's 21 at this point. He's like, wow, that's so cool. Would you sign up for that, Jade? Katie, yeah, Jade's, yeah, Katie. Katie's smiling, yeah, two years in India, that sounds sort of cool. And he's excited too. So he decides to leave the Freedom Rides because he's got to go to Philadelphia and interview for this position in India. So he leaves. Of course, his bus continues on and in Anston, Alabama, his bus is targeted. And this is the bus that he was scheduled to be on. Uh, it is attacked, shot at, has its tire shot out and then it's firebombed. Uh, the, the Freedom Riders on the bus take off and get and head out. It's, uh, it's completely dramatic. Um, the, and, and here, this is, this is the image that's put on the cover of uh, the second volume of March. Yeah. Although it's sort of interesting to see it compared to the real thing. Um, what do you see as the difference? Do you guys see a difference here? Jade, Kate? I would say in the right image, the fire is very alive. It's dramatized versus in the left picture, the fire is kind of smoldering down. Um, there's smoke left, which makes me think of, you know, if there are people inside, they're gonna die from smoke inhalation versus burning to death. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, you know, it's really a dramatic moment. I mean, it is sort of, it is, I mean, getting the color is, is astonishing, although, yeah, yeah, it's, and then the black billowing clouds. It's interesting you get the blue sort of interspersed in where you don't get it there. The other thing, of course, you get is the people, right? Both the good people who are running for their lives, as the Freedom Riders do, and the people who are doing this to them, right? This picture here has no people in it, you know, in the graphic novel, and the graphic autobiography, you can put those in. All right. This is a complete fiasco. The next bus, the other bus, goes to Montgomery, Alabama, and the uh, Bull Connor, uh, no, that's, uh, it's in Birmingham. In Birmingham, Bull Connor's pulled the cops out of the bus stop, and they are going to get, and, and the bus is going to be greeted by the Ku Klux Klan. Bull Connor gives the Klan 15 minutes of uninterrupted time to beat the crap out of the Freedom Riders. And that's exactly what the Klan does. So you get both buses. One's destroyed, the other one is just a melee and they're, they're defeated. And it looks like the Corps' program of going from New, uh, Bo uh, Boston, New York, Washington to New Orleans isn't gonna work. It's just not gonna work. At this point, John Lewis hears about it. He's in Nashville, right, getting ready to go to Philadelphia. And he's like, holy smokes, that's my bus that's exploded. That's my bus and those are my friends on the news. And so they immediately go to try to see if they can help out. What's the story with the people who are missing? And then there's gonna be a great, there's gonna be a great meeting in Montgomery, Alabama, trying to figure out what to do next. At the Montgomery meeting, the SNCC leaders are gonna decide that when, when this nonviolent protest, which is what, the freedom rides are, are met with violence, you can't give in to violence. And so the, the SNCC program, the SNCC leaders are gonna say, we need to continue, um, we need to continue the freedom rides. So they arrange for the freedom rides to go on. And so John Lewis, who was going to Philadelphia, does not go to Philadelphia. In fact, he's gonna end up getting on one of the first buses for the freedom rides when they continue 
and they're going to go to Jackson, Mississippi. Now, the president's negotiated a deal with Jackson, uh, with Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett, where the Freedom Riders aren't going to get killed. Okay, we're not going to let the, the Klan kill them. But as part of the deal, Kennedy is going to allow Ross Barnett to arrest the Freedom Riders for disturbing the peace. And so the Freedom Riders are all going to go to jail. Um, initially, they go to the local jail. Um, this is this is uh, this is of course the actual um, mug shots of John Lewis from when he's arrested. Uh, but then, after a month, they're going to end up going to the most infamous jail in the South, Parchman uh, Farm, which was an old slave plantation and became a a uh, giant penitentiary workhouse uh, where. Um, primarily African-American inmates were forced uh, to work um, as part of their, and, 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 just to be, and where they were also, you know, they were serving out their sentences and they were forced to work on this, uh, in this farm. John Lewis uh, is sent there. This is becomes, you know, this becomes a, a moment of great conflict. The, the civil rights activists, though, don't give in, they don't give up, they keep their spirits up, and lo and behold, uh, they win. They win. Eventually, they're going to be uh, they're going to be released, and the federal government in September of 19, uh, 1961 is going to start enforcing the Supreme Court's decision, which had been that interstate commerce needed to be desegregated. So another big win. So we got a, we got the sit-ins work. They desegregated the lunch counters in Nashville and elsewhere in the South, and the uh, and the freedom rights work. John Lewis is becoming quite a figure, of course, finding himself in the middle of both the Freedom Rides and the sit-in movements. And he's going to become very active in the new student movement that's created at this time. And it's going to be the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, the basic ideas and the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee are originally very heavily Nashville-based. But by 1861 and 1862, the Nashville group is getting sort of edged out. Uh, there's people who are more activist and aren't in favor of the nonviolence um, as much as the uh, national group, which is really committed to it ideologically. In fact, and you know, you see this in, in this one, um, Jim Lawson, who, who wrote the statement of purpose for SNCC, and SNCC is how you say it, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, he gets basically out, put out of SNCC. He's not allowed to address SNCC, but, but the compromise is John Lewis's disciple is going to be put on the executive committee. Um, well, 1962 happens, 1963, we're going to see, you know, a ton of stuff happening. We're going to see Birmingham campaign. We're going to see a lot of murders. Two days after, um, after, uh, Uh, I'm totally blanking on the name. Uh, two days after uh, an NCA, uh, na uh, National says uh, NAACP leader Medgar Evers is killed in Mississippi. John Lewis gets called to an emergency meeting of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee leadership, where Chuck McAdoo uh, Chuck McAdoo was resigning. Uh, Interestingly, he gets in a car wreck, something that may not make most stories, but he ends up making it there, and he's going to become elected as the chairman of the Student Nonviolent, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And it's in that position that he's going to end up making his famous speech on Washington, uh, his address in the March on Washington. Now, if I can do the technology better this time, hopefully, and you guys will indulge me. I'm looking for this. I'm going to try to show you a little piece on, I'm going to sh stop share, and I'm going to share a little. And we all had to prepare a speech. I was very young, 23 years old, put all of my hair and a few pounds lighter. I have the pleasure to present to this when A. Philip Randolph said, I now present to you young John Lewis, the national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Brother John Lewis. Look to my right. I saw hundreds and hundreds of young people who have been involved 
during the early days. Look straight ahead. I saw this sea of humanity. Then I looked to the left. I saw young black men and young white men up in the trees trying to get a better view. And then I said to myself, but this is it. And I looked straight ahead again. And something said to me, go for it. And I opened my mouth and I started speaking. We march today for jobs and freedom. We have nothing to be proud of. Of hundreds and thousands of our brothers are not here. Or they're receiving starvation wages or no wages at all. Those who have said be patient and wait, we must say that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. The time will come. We will not confine our march into Washington. We will march through the South, through the streets of Jackson, through the streets of Danville, through the streets of Cambridge, through the streets of Birmingham. Wake up, but we cannot stop, and we will not take another vacation. Where's my PowerPoint? There it is. Okay, so John Lewis uh, gives uh, really the most radical speech at the March for Washington. In fact, uh, there's a little backstory there that uh, many may not know. Uh, the Archbishop of Washington, D.C., was going to give the uh, was going to give the blessing at the March for Washington, and he heard some of the rhetoric that John Lewis was talking. He was talking about revolution. He was talking about the masses, and he was like, "I don't want to be part of this." Um, and so there was a lot of negotiations to try to get John Lewis to call to tone it down a little bit, so that. Um, it wouldn't ruin the day. Um, this becomes a this becomes this this moment of conflict uh, where John Lewis ends up running a um, um, uh, John Lewis ends up meeting with the uh, uh, a Philip Randolph, the man who's organizing the March on Washington, the man who tried to organize the March on Washington in 1941 uh, to end segregation on the eve of America's entry into World War II. John Lewis is, uh, A. Philip Randolph comes up and basically says, I've been waiting for this for 20, I've been working for this for 20 years, please don't ruin it. And so John Lewis um, basically agrees and says, that's fine. He couldn't, he couldn't not Call, he couldn't tone it down a little bit, but he doesn't feel like he's toned it down too much. He said, we will not be patient. We are not gonna wait. Maybe I'm not gonna use the word revolution, but the time is now. And so John Lewis becomes the person. Now, of course, he's not the most famous speech at the March for Washington, even if he is the most radical. The most famous, of course, is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Uh, but John Lewis was there really trying to represent the students and push the, uh, push the agenda forward. That's 1963. Now, 1963 um, is going to end up seeing the death of Kennedy. Uh, Lyndon Johnson is going to use the death of Kennedy to push for a Civil Rights Act, which falling on the, e, uh, falling on the heels of uh, Birmingham and the March on Washington and other things is going to ultimately pass. So we are going to see desegregation in the public square um, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What the Civil Rights Act of 1964 does not do is take care of voting. And that's going to be the next issue the civil rights activists work on. And John Lewis is going to take a, another, a lead there too. Um, in Selma, Alabama, they, there had been activists trying to get African Americans registered to vote, and it just didn't work. It just didn't work. Uh, 
And so they were going to make, they were going to try to figure out a way to make uh, a movement to help the people of Selma, um, Alabama. Now, the people of Selma, Alabama needed help. Uh, there were people who were um, dying. The civil rights movement, civil rights movement, we are going to see people who are going to get killed fairly regularly um, as they're trying to fight segregation. At one of these funerals, um, James Bevel, one of the Nashville guys, says we shouldn't just carry we shouldn't just carry um, Jackson, the guy who died, to, to his grave. We should carry his uh, coffin to Montgomery, Alabama, because the reason he died is because the governors of the state. And um, he went to, uh, he went to, um, they said, you know what, that's a great idea. And so they decided from that to have, uh, after Jimmy Lee Jackson died, they decided that they were gonna have a march from Selma to Montgomery petitioning for the right to vote. Um, a lot of SNCC people, including people in core, you know, Jim Foreman, people that John Lewis is fairly close to think that this is not gonna work. It's a mistake. But John Lewis, even though he's the uh, executive director of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, is also an Alabaman. And he is deeply committed to making it work and participating in Selma. So the organization he's a part of is eventually going to back out of it. But he's going to become part of it. He's going to march not as the lead of SNCC, but as John Lewis. He's going to march as an individual. So on March 7th, 1965, he goes to Selma, Alabama to lead a march from Brown Street Chapel, and they're going to set out across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And on the left, you see the photograph, and on the right, you see from the vantage point of the civil rights movement, the civil rights activists headed towards the uh, law enforcement officers on the other end of the bridge. Now, this is the most famous moment of um, John Lewis's career. And here is the way uh, that the graphic novel decided to describe the violence. I'll just give you a second to look at that. Dr. Green, can you um, start the part of it so it's a little larger? I, uh, let me... I have to put play from current slide. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna stop share and I'm gonna try to start share again. Uh, is that better? Sorry start about the, that, guys. Start the slideshow, Patrick. What? Start the slideshow. Play from well. Uh, Play from current slide. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Beautiful. Now, this, of course, is something that we've seen represented in other ways. This is actually a photograph of John Lewis as one of the law enforcement officers is, is either, it looks like just hit him with a baton on his head or is about to. John Lewis's skull is fractured in this melee. Um, here it is, he thinks he sees his death. But this was an incredibly successful moment in the sense that America saw this on TV and couldn't believe it was happening. People came to Alabama to get involved and to be part of the next march, which was gonna happen uh, as soon as they could organize. And in fact, it did on March 22nd, they started the march where thousands of people marched from Selma to Montgomery. It took a long time. John Lewis, even with the fractured skull, ended up going with them. His doctors let him go and march during the day, and then each night he'd have to get driven back to the hospital because they wanted to make sure he wasn't going to have any more complications. But here it is: the march on Washington, uh, the march on Washington, the march, um, the march to uh, from Selma to Montgomery. Of course, those march is going to be a success, and it's going to be capped, of course, by action in Washington, not in Montgomery, where Lyndon Johnson is going to sign in August the Voting Rights Act, which is going to guarantee voting rights for African Americans in places where they had not had their rights uh, protected um, federally. Okay, 
this is John Lewis's legacy. And instead of ending with sort of my take on it, and we can, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk more about it next week. I wanna, John Lewis knew he was dying when he died. And here's John Lewis actually at, um, at the Black Lives Matter Plaza, just days before his death. Um, he went into the hospital the next day for treatment after this. But this is, this is at the Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, D.C. He also did something unusual, which was he penned a um, letter to America that he directed the New York Times to publish on the day of his funeral, which was um, July 30th of 2020. And I want to just tell you what he tells us as a way to finish. Democracy is not a state, he writes, it is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and a world at peace with itself. You must study and learn the lessons of history. I sort of include this because I'm a historian, I like that. Because history is involved with the soul, uh, in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. When historians to pick up, pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence and aggression and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sister, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. All right. I really want to thank you guys for joining me um, for this little retrospective of John Lewis's life. I wanted you to see this, to meet John Lewis if you haven't met him before. Um, I also wanted you to see how a, how a graphic autobiography presents his life. Um, next week, his co-author, and the illustrator will be here at the Humanities Forum. And now that you know about John Lewis, I hope you'll join us as we discuss how we portray, how we think about this man who Barack Obama has provocatively put up as one of our founding fathers. Thank you all for taking time out of your Fridays. Thank you especially to Katie and Jade for joining on the, uh, uh, as, our, as our stand-in audience. Do not be afraid to email me if you're thinking about this or viewing this and you have questions, especially if you have questions we want to talk about next week. Tomorrow, next week's discussion is going to be a discussion. So I do want to hear your input. So please feel free to email me, pbreen at providence.edu, with anything you might want me to ask them. I also encourage you to read more about John Lewis. You've got John Lewis's own autobiography, Walking with the Wind. You've got March. You also have a you all have a new movie put out, which has got very good ratings on Rotten Tomatoes called um, uh, Good Trouble. So read a little bit about John Lewis, find out about a little bit about more, read the letter in the New York Times that he published, and then come back next, next Friday and we can talk a little bit more about John Lewis. Thank you all for joining us this Friday afternoon. I hope you all have a fabulous, fabulous day. Thank you. <laughs>